Good morning, party people. It is Black Friday, and I'm happy to report that this has been the best Black Friday sales that uh, we've done ever. Turns out that y'all really like my new lifetime options for uh, training classes, so that's kind of cool. Um, so I'm taking a break in between doing customer support emails, which come in fast and furious, and let's do some of your questions from over at Office Hours. There are actually a lot of really good questions here. So the top voted question uh, asked by Marion, the database that my company developed for over 20 years has a lot of design problems, normalization and performance issues. <coughs> the business wants to keep fixing whatever issues are there and will appear. Would you rather build a new one or fix the existing one from scratch? So the thing is, is it providing value today? Is the business getting a lot of value out of it? And if it's not, if the business is like, oh, man, this thing is broken, it, we, it just, we can't ship orders or whatever, then that's one thing. But I bet the business is getting enough value that they don't mind fixing things as they go forward. I know you think that you should just start wipe away and start the whole thing from scratch again, but there's so much risk and there's so much time that's involved with that. Plus, too, what do you think? Just because you're involved now, the system is going to be perfect? I got news for you. It's always going to have problems, even if you wipe over, start over from scratch and go build a brand new one. And the cost to go build a new one usually is so much higher than the maintenance costs of limping along with the one that you've already got. Now, I say that personally from experience because back in the late 1990s, I built an intranet for uh, uh, the company that I worked for. Um, we were trying to get off of McAfee Help Desk software, and McAfee Help Desk had this really high maintenance cost. It was just junk and garbage. And so what I did was I took in classic ASP back in the old days. I built a bunch of web forms so that we could work without having to go through McAfee, that we could keep the database back end, and we just have a different front end on there. And then over time, uh, we ended up canceling McAfee, and we ended up using this intranet that I built. I went back to that company like 15 years later. They were still using my janky classic ASP help desk uh, with its back end of the McAfee help desk database because it was just good enough. It provided enough value. And even though everybody knew it was terrible, it was a bad database design, you really wish you could start over, it worked. It worked well enough and outstripped the cost of trying to build a new one from scratch. So most of the time, you're best off just working with the existing system and continuously adding features and paying down technical debt gradually. Next up, let's see here. Next up, George says, I'm a SQL dev, learning uh, performance, DBA, enthusiastic amateur. Man, you need to figure out how to use less words to describe what you do. We have an external consultant who said SQL Server is self-tuning and reevaluates after three runs. I cannot find anything about this online. Do you have any idea what they might mean? So when someone tells you something and you don't believe them, don't ask someone else for evidence. Ask the person who told you that. That's why I'm a really big fan of in my blog posts. I like to give you demos and go, here you go. Here's the database. Here's the scripts. You see how this works. You know, here's proof that it works this way, and you go see how this works. And if that person can't give you written evidence from Microsoft or demos or whatever, then that's your answer. People will lie to you throughout your career, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, and you've got to have a better BS detector to challenge them. Don't go out and bother other people, because I don't have the time to disprove whatever some yo-yo is saying. Next up, Chai Harley asks, Microsoft is pushing my client to activate the SQL infrastructure as a service extension on their Azure VMs. Do you ha like to enable the extension, or do you have an opinion on it? So let's see here. So Microsoft wants you to install something that costs money. I wonder why they would do that. And somebody out there is going to be like, well, no, Brent, it doesn't cost any money. It's free with your Azure account. Right, but what does it start phoning home to do? Does it leverage additional Microsoft services? Does it suggest that you're going to back up to Azure, for example? Are there ways that Microsoft can start keeping tabs on your environment and helping you to use services that cost money up in Azure? And can you imagine what their motivation might be? Now, having said that, 
when SQL Server 2022 came out, uh, SQL Server 2022 has the ability to pay as you go for licensing, which I personally think is awesome. I think it's a great usage of phoning home because it should have to phone home to reduce your accounting. You don't really want to track uh, how many CPU cores of licensing that you use and things like that. Uh, but just, you know, it, if, through any time Microsoft or any company it says that you should install something that they built, duh, that's called sales and marketing. And if you act now, we'll throw in a free teddy bear, absolutely free. Uh, next up, Brentasaur asks, how about creating fundamentals of locking and blocking classes? I would love to watch them. So when I think of my fundamentals classes and my mastering classes, Fundamentals are things that I can teach you from start to finish inside one day. Mastering classes tend to be built on top of the fundamentals, that you have to already know the fundamentals in order to go tackle these other concepts. And so I have locking and blocking modules in mastering index tuning, mastering query tuning, and mastering server tuning. But those are mastering level things. But I don't expect people at the fundamentals level to understand locking and blocking and how to fix it. You already have to have been through the fundamentals classes before you can go start tackling those additional things. Uh, next up, Carlo asks, Hi Brent, any updates regarding the problem of always on cluster errors due to heartbeat timeouts based on Veeam snapshots? So let's see here. You have a problem with a third party product and you're asking a blogger if there are any updates. Let's see, do I work for Veeam? No, no I don't. Do I, is a product open source that I could contribute to it? No, no it's not. What the hell are you asking me for? Why are you asking me? What do you think I'm going to do? You think I'm going to pull a Veeam update out of my rear end and apply it on your servers? I'm going to pull something out of my rear end and apply it on your servers, but it's not going to be a Veeam update. Nothing against Veeam. I'm, I'm sure the product is, well, obviously it's not completely fine, right? Because you're asking that question. But go to the place where you should ask that question, right? If you're having a problem with a third-party product, go talk to the third-party people. Duh. Uh, Jessica asks, hey, Brent. Have you recently done a talk, or do you know a good recent talk on YouTube for setting up log shipping for DR? It's been a while since I had to deal with the last one. I wanted to make sure there aren't any new gotchas. Nope, log shipping hasn't changed since the dawn of time. Anything that you find uh, that's like 10, 15 years ago still is relevant today. The same basics are all still out there. You can run into some issues uh, with modern features. For example, uh, if you use transparent data encryption, you know, you're going to have to put in the extra steps of putting the cert keys, certs uh, over on the secondary server. Now, but even that isn't new. It's like 2005 or whatever. So yeah, the old stuff is completely fine there. Cassian asks a really good question. How do you know if auto growth events are benign or problematic? So true story. For some reason, I, my brain just freezes on the terms benign, benign and malevolent, malignant, malignant. Those are the two like cancer words. I never remember which one's good and which one's bad. I can just never remember. And I always have to stop and think but benign is okay. Malignant is bad. And I've had to repeat that to myself so many times through the years. Um, so auto growth events are bad if they cause a blocking firestorm. If the blocking goes on for a while, long enough that your end users notice, that's a problem. So what I tell people is I'm, I'm fine with auto grow being on, but set up auto grow in a way that it finishes within a second or two. If it takes more than a second or two in order to finish the auto growth events, you probably want to turn down the auto growth size and then set up an alert so that when auto growth happens, you know that you have to go start pre-sizing out your data files because they're not large enough right now. And then, oh, interesting, we'll do one more. Um, Double espressos for breakfast ass. Hi, Brent, love all that you've done for the SQL community. You're welcome. Uh, you're clearly a bright guy. That's just because of all the lighting in here. <laughs> um, oh, I was going to say, I didn't know if my rim shot worked there. Uh, and could do anything you put your mind to. That is totally not true, I can tell you that. Now, why did you choose database administration of all things? 
So I, uh, I used to work in hotels, hotels and restaurants. Um, let me even start back further than that. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to first be a race car driver when I figured out I was too big to pull that off and not enough talent. Uh, then I figured out I wanted to, to uh, go teach accounting and entrepreneurial as entrepreneurialism over in uh, the breaking out of communism. So the Berlin Wall was falling, communism was becoming entrepreneurial, like Russia Russia was uh, becoming entrepreneurial. I was like, I'm going to go over and teach accounting and entrepreneurship and business over there because I thought that would be really exciting. I got like two, three accounting classes in and I was like, nope, I'm not doing that. I do not want to spend the rest of my life trying to balance pennies. Screw it. It's not worth it. Um, so then when I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up, I dropped out of college and went into hotels and restaurants because that was all that I'd ever known. My family had been involved in hotels and restaurants. Um, so I worked my way up through hotels and restaurants j to the point where I was managing hotels. And the problem with working in hotels is that you're always working weekends and holidays when other people want to go out to eat, when other people want to stay places. That's when you're stuck working somewhere. And I wanted to have my weekends and holidays off. So I was like, all right, let me recalculate what I want to do with my career. And so I went to work for a hotel management company. Uh, I was pretty good with numbers, despite the fact that I dropped out of college with accounting. It wasn't that good. Uh, and so I was involved with budgeting spreadsheets and then centralizing the budgeting data across lots of hotels using, with the time it wasn't Excel, it was Quattro Pro, it was a better product back then, um, and got really good at Quattro Pro macros and, and scraping data from lots of spreadsheets. Um, so then went to work for a hotel accounting software company. I wasn't a developer at the time. This was around about like 1999. I wasn't a developer at the time, so my boss sent me to classes uh, on how to use top speed Clarion was the development language back at the time that that company was using. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. Top speed Clarion wasn't bad, uh, but then we needed to migrate everything over to either Java or .NET. And so my boss handed me a couple of books and he's like, go learn Java and .NET and figure out which one we're going to move to because I was leading the development team at the time. And I, I got like ankle deep in learning both of them. And I was like, I really hate both of these. I don't want to be debugging for the rest of my life. And there's a joke in here about the SQL debugger, I'm sure. Uh, but I, I was doing database work at the time because our apps had a back end in uh, SQL Server. And I, I liked SQL Server, and I thought the SQL language uh, is pretty timeless. I thought even if SQL Server blows chunks, I can switch over to Oracle, MySQL, whatever. Uh, so at least that way I wouldn't have to keep learning new languages. And database administrators were very highly paid, and they were hard to find, and still are. Uh, so it was a relatively easy way to make a lot of money without having to go through long, drawn-out, expensive education because there just weren't good database administrator degrees, and there still aren't. Uh, so there we go. So there's a round of questions from Office Hours. I'm now going to go hop over and go back to doing uh, customer support emails for Black Friday. I should put a shot out. <laughs> So my Black Friday sale is running now. If you go to brentozar.com slash Black Friday, this is when I do my big, massive, huge percentage off kind of things. Uh, so you can get my training classes. You can get bundles with training classes, SQL Constant Care, and the Consultant Toolkit. And new this year, there's even a lifetime option. So you can just buy once, and you have my Fundamentals and Masters training classes for the rest of your life. So head on over there to brentozar.com slash Black Friday, and I will start doing some support emails. Adios.